Well, my lord, there are two applications yep. for your lordship. Um, the first is the jurisdictional challenge, and the second is the immediate judgment <laughs> but, but, but apart from the jurisdictional challenge, there's no opposition to the to your your summary immediate judgment application. Well, my lord, there is opposition to it, but it seems to be largely based on the same grounds that are. Yeah, is it based on anything else? Well, my lord, that's uh, it. it, it, it uh, seems from the from the from the evidence and from the submissions made, uh, it seemed that the abuse of process argument is the one that's being run in both applications. Yeah. My lord, and he can explain it better than I. Yeah. But that didn't seem to us to be a, a substantive defence put forward, and the for some other reason grounds seem to repeat the months that were set out in the jurisdiction challenge. Okay. I was rather expecting that my learned friend would like to go first on the jurisdiction challenge, and I wouldn't have been against that. Well, we'll see. Um, I, I just want to know from you what do you what do you say about the Singapore judgment being under appeal? Uh, my lord, we say it's not a defence to enforcement. No, no, it's not a defence to enforcement. But um, what do you say in practice? I should do about it if you're if you're otherwise right. Uh, my lord, in practice, uh, we should have the enforcement order and any equitable claim for stays of execution belong in the execution proceedings which have already started and been stayed. So Lord, we are seeking a judgment today, um, yes. a recognition judgment, and then the execution thereof is a matter for separate claims which have already been started and stayed. Can you, uh, can you tell me how, how, how far has the Singapore appeal process got? Lord, it's... Uh, it started, it hasn't been heard. Um, we know that there was a stay execution application which was rejected. Um, we, we don't know how long it will take, but it, it won't be perhaps this side of the end of the year. Is, it, is this a leave to appeal application or is it? A, a, oh, my Lord. It's, uh, it's a, the, the, the second Singapore judgment was based on an originating summons procedure and there is an automatic right of appeal for that, as I understand it. So the Singapore judgment is presently under appeal. They've, yes. refused, they've refused the stay of execution, is that right? That's my understanding, well, yes. And that's, uh, we put in a, a statement just confirming that uh, yesterday. It seemed that yes. it was not accepted, but I think it now is accepted that that's the position. Right. And so you say you should be, if they refuse to stay of execution, there's no reason that I shouldn't simply proceed. Well, well once once the judgment has been given here, um, we do accept that the court has obviously the flexibility to grant stays of execution and, and the rules provide that. But we say that's a matter for the execution process. We have the right to have judgment entered um, and what happens after that. We'll follow that. There's a difference between having a right to judgment and having and getting judgment as a matter of discretion. Um, my lord, the, the one or two, just put it like what I was thinking about before we before we met. One one possibility would be that as regards that part of the application, I simply adjourned it until I wait and see what happens in Singapore. Well, my lord, that's we, we submit that is there is no discretion here. If if you're satisfied that this judgment is final and conclusive, if you're satisfied that there's no defence to it, then the fact that it's under appeal is not a defence to having it recognised and enforced. It, it is possibly a factor that the court can take into consideration at the execution stage, uh, and, and we say that that's a two-stage process and the authorities reflect that. Okay, right. Um, so what do you want to tell me? Uh, I want to tell you that I've read the I've read the skeletons. I should yes. say. So, um, Lord, the, it seems the, to me there's only two points really that are raised against you. Perhaps it's oversimplifying. One is the uh, the abuse of process point because it's the, because of the proceedings in, uh, in Dubai onshore Dubai, and the other and that can be dressed up in many ways. But it's just it's said that um, the, the matter should be resolved by the. Uh, JJR, is it? I always forget. Um, JJC. Well, JJC. JJT, it's been called many names. Um, but but, but, but the, the, the problem with that is there doesn't seem at the moment to be a dispute about jurisdiction. 
by on shore has refused jurisdiction. Um, this, this court hasn't made a ruling on it yet. And um, so there's no reason for an automatic stay according to Court of Appeal Authority in DIFC. My Lord, yes, the, the, the Court of Appeal Authority, and it goes back beyond the recent authorities on the JJC, it goes back to the authorities on the Supreme Court. Yeah. It goes back to 2015. You need an actual conflict in order to refer it to those bodies. And, and you, what, I want, what I wanted to ask you about this is why is it an either or? In terms of jurisdiction, surely a, a judgment creditor can try and secure his, the assets um, anywhere in the world, and he can go in, both in DIFC and in Dubai if he wants to. Yeah, yes, Lord, it, that that's completely right. Um, and the fact that they've started different proceedings in onshore Dubai as a matter of law is not a reason for you to stay proceedings, whatever the nature of these proceedings are, but it's even yeah. more pertinent at the enforcement stage because there would be there would be no reason not to enforce wherever assets can be found. I think my learned friend's point is that we should we should have gone to the Dubai courts to enforce rather than the DIC courts. Um, but that's not really that's it's not open to him to run that point. It's uh, you have jurisdiction or what this court clearly yeah. does have standard yeah. practice. So that leads, to, that leads to the other point, which is the conduit jurisdiction, which has been well established now in DIFC. For I can't remember what the leading case is, but it's DNB Bank, my lord. It's it goes back again to 2015. Uh, it's clear as day that there's even if it was a pure conduit application, which it isn't, it, it would there'd be nothing wrong with that. Yeah, so so that is legally untenable as a defense. Can you remind me of where, where I find that case in the bundle? Uh, yes, or well, it's um, page 1589. Uh, sorry for the page reference, but um, I think the relevant paragraphs are later in the judgment. Um, it's uh, 1609, paragraph 126 to 130. Uh, so it really clearly knocks this argument out of the water because uh, that was exactly the point that was run in that case that there were no assets in the DIFC, apparently, which was not accepted, and that uh, it, it wasn't open to a judgment creditor to get a judgment in the DIFC and then refer it on to Dubai. Um, and it's 126 onwards or 125 onwards. The judgment referred to the Traxis case and it said that even if there were no, definitely no assets in the DIFC, that would not be far to enforcement. Um, paragraph 127 referred to previous case, well, the Maidan case said that even if there are no assets, there are legitimate benefits to a judgment creditor in obtaining a DIFC judgment. And it referred to things like the ability to get worldwide freezing orders, third party debt orders, and importantly, orders for in, uh, examination of the judgment debtor as to his or her assets. Um, and that's that's really what we're talking about here. Um, my learned friend says there can't be any conceivable benefit because there are no assets in the DIFC. We say we don't accept that there are no assets in the DIFC because we don't accept uh, really the word of this defendant given his track record uh, and number two even if there were none we would still have the right to have this judgment entered and enforced in the DIFC for the purposes into alia of having mk as i'll call him examined as to his assets etc 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 so the conduit jurisdiction um, was clearly confirmed there there's nothing wrong with that even if it were a pure conduit in 
Um, yeah. Well, is there anything else you wanted to say before I ask Mr. Joseph to um, to answer some points? Uh, just that the, the forum non convenience argument is equally. Well, that's not. Is that a separate point? Uh, well, I guess they're all bound together in the law, but whatever way you dress it up, forum non convenience. Uh, but we have to wait for the JJC or the fact that it's a conduit in case none of these are legally. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on the JJC point, the is Lacan against Lamia. That's the. Yes. Uh, well, well, that's, do you want me to take you to that? Uh, no, I read it last night. And. Just to, can I just quickly make a point on that? So what page is that in the bundle? It's 1781. Yeah, let's just turn it up for a moment. 1781, about paragraph 30-ish. Yes, my lord, just, if I could very quickly the, the point I wanted to make is the paragraph 33. It just clearly says that the mere existence of claims in both jurisdictions is not enough to trigger this stay or a JJC reference. And then at paragraph 36, it says that that makes good sense because otherwise there would be the opportunity for abuse yeah. by one party having the ability to simply commence proceedings onshore, then refer the matter to the JJC and then say that the DIFC proceedings needed to be stayed. And um, my Lord, that's what we say has happened here. This, this whole, the onshore proceedings and the JJC proceedings are, they are the abusive proceedings here. It's not our proceedings, it's theirs. So, you know, if that does come back to be a matter of discretion, my lord, it points flatly against my learned friend and his colleagues. Uh, and I, I did have another point, my lord, if I could just. Yeah, if one looks at the, what they've actually done in the JJC. Mm -hmm. I, I want you to just look at that application that they made. Where, where is it? That's at page 181 and, and, and onwards. 181. 181, yes, my Lord. But I wanted to take you to uh, further down to paragraph 40, which is one page 198. So 1918. Sorry, one nine eight. And just, um, I, I just wanted to draw your lordship's attention to what. Give me a moment. Give me a moment. I was waiting for it to come up. I do apologise. No <clears throat> Let's try again. Hang on. System is extremely slow, um, but it's. Uh... I don't know whether it's my connection or. It's the system, but it, it just seems to be 
extremely slow the new system we we normally just use pdfs because of this very problem because i've got, I've got it in pdf if I, I can use hang on a second Page numbering the same? Uh, yes. One nine eight. Yes. Yeah. And and if your lordship just looks through some of these things that they've been asking the JJSA to do in this case, um, paragraph forty. A B C D E F G H I J. Yeah, I'm not going to take you through all of them, but I would invite your lordship to read this because this is not an application made in good faith to seek resolution of a jurisdictional conflict. What they're asking the JJC to do is to make decisions about, for example, um, whether a freezing order should be complied with by a bank or whether um, uh, an order, an interlocutory order, 40E, is final and executory within the meaning of Article 7.2 of the jail. Lord, that's got nothing to do with their Dubai claim. What they're trying to do in this is relitigate the freezing order application, which didn't go their way on April the 25th. And all of the uh, many of these questions in 40 have nothing to do with the Dubai proceedings that they've raised. They're, they're simply asking the JJC to change the law to uh, to to ban the conduit jurisdiction um, uh, to, to to preclude the claimant from issuing any applications. These are not matters that I mean. The JJC does have an advisory capacity it can advise the government uh, and the judicial council as to laws and rules that should be made but it, it's not the purpose of the JJC to overrule um, decisions of the DIFC court etc etc and Lord, if you, I'm not going to take through each paragraph but my submission is if you read paragraph 40 it's absolutely plain that this is this JJC application and the onshore proceedings are just simply a torpedo tactic, um, an abusive tactic. Um, can you, can we, I, I, I follow your submission, but I've lost you. I've lost a picture of any of anything. I can draw <laughs> the word, but I can't. In the middle of looking at that fascinating um, document, I've lost contact completely. I'm, not, I'm sure if I press one button, I'll get the right thing, but. The, uh, maybe if I speak, I will show up on the screen. I, I don't know if uh, I can see your lordship. But you can, can you see me? I can, yes. I can see oh. you very clearly. Uh. <laughs> but you cannot see me. You can hear yes. me. I can just see my, my screen. Oh, hang on there. Yeah. Is the case progression officer there? Um, I'm not sure what's happened. Uh, me neither, my lord. It does seem to be. I can see myself. I can see you. I can see your lordship. <laughs> uh, this system today seems to be curious problems. Um, I tell you what, I better go out and then come back in again. I'm not sure I, can. I can't go out unless I know how to go out. It's the big red button, I think, at the top. Yes, but I haven't got a screen, that's the problem. <sighs> I haven't got a, any part of the screen belonging to the system. It, 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 it's possible um, I, I just, that, that by calling up the 
um, electronic bundle that you maybe your screen is dominated by the electronic bundle rather than seeing Mr. Holloway. I don't, is there a red button you can press uh, to close down the bundle? I can close it, but I can go out of this, that system. But, would, that, uh, would that exit the whole thing or would it just close the bundle? It would exit the whole thing. Ah, okay. Um, Escape key. I can join again. I'll join again. Both of you hang on there. Uh, I can see, I can see, I can see what's going on too, but I got to go next. I'll be back. There is an echo though, isn't there? Yeah. I said, well, I think altogether, I'll join in from Who's the Are we all going out and coming back in again? Do you think all? Oh, I'm still here. Ah. <laughs> well, well, I, I'm back where I was but, at the but, beginning. But, but frozen. You're frozen, my lord. Yes. Um, I may be frozen, but I can't see anything apart from my screen. Oh. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt everyone. Lord Glenny, if we can uh, all join through Teams, I think that would be a little bit better. Yes. Could you send me a link? Um, it's actually in the same, um, in the same page that you join. There is a small link that says uh, powered by team. OK, I'll do that. Right. Just, How do I get out of this one first? Um, it, you just have to click on leave, I believe, on the top right. I haven't got it because I haven't got any any of the system on my screen. Oh, just hold on, hold on, don't do anything. Just keep the picture on, please. I don't want to turn my computer off. It will take ages to start again. Uh, no, no, no need for that. Um, just give me a second, please. Yes, Mr. Holloway. Thank you. Just, just to reassure you, that wasn't me making submissions with that uh, noise that we heard earlier. That was. Uh, it's like me, wasn't it? Uh, uh, okay. so I was inviting you, my lord, to look at the JJC reference, and I to this is, this is where it all went wrong. In what one one nine eight? Indeed, my lord. I'm going to try and stick to the um, the court system, or should I, I do the I, other? I don't want to put a span in the works, everybody, but I, I can't now see Lord Glenny. Oh. Um, it, my screen says waiting for participants to join. <laughs> <laughs> so you've definitely had an improvement on one aspect of this. Can, can, Mr. Mr. Joseph Holloway. Oh, can you admit the participants, Mr. Joseph, or is it? Um... I can't do anything. Um, Saeed, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Lord Glenn. Mr. Joseph can't see me. Um, if you, I believe if you, if we all could just do the same thing and join by clicking Power by Teams. Okay, let's try that. It should take you straight to the Teams app instead of the browser. Yay. Yes, perfect. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to kick your other account out. We had two of you there, Mr. Joseph. Mm. The more the merrier. <laughs> um, actually, Mr. Joseph, um, I can't really determine which one is the one that is um, by teams. 
Oh, actually, hold on. I found it. Hold on. I'm now hearing echo. Can you kick me off the um, first connection, which, whichever that one was? Yes, done. There's only one of you now. Excellent. Excellent. Right, are we good to go? Well, I'll, I'll try and. You're, you're, on page, you're on page 198 or something. I, I was inviting Roger to look at page 198 and paragraph 40 of yeah. the. Uh, you showed me the sort of things they're asking the J, JJC to do. Uh, well, 40A. Yeah. Can they be subject to the DIC court's jurisdiction when none of the gateways in Article 5? apply um i'm just this is not you know there's not a proper question it's not it's not pertinent to either the dubai proceedings or or these um b but i can't uh, but pausing there was by the way i can't tell the jjc what to do no so, i'm not i'm not no. i'm not asking you what to do at all but um if you're, if you're right then those are points that can be made to the jjc well, my point is simply that that this reference is not saying there are conflicting proceedings in Dubai and the DIC, which one is the right one. It's actually asking for a whole raft of broad academic yeah. questions, which and it's asking them to reform the law. And then in paragraph, in the prayer at the end, uh, 209, C. Yeah. An order that the respondent cease and desist from filing proceedings for their applications, whether interim or final. Um, look, that the JJC doesn't have any competence to do that at all. Um, so, uh, my submission is these are abusive proceedings. They are what the Khan of Lamia is warning against. Um, they are um, attempts to torpedo um, and attempts to undermine what this court has, has already done. Uh, so yeah. the, free, the freezing order is attacked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then just final two very brief points, my lord. The the um, respondents here, the defendants, in both the Dubai proceedings and the JJC proceedings. They've been started by the first defendant, MK. And in both those proceedings, MK says he's starting the proceedings on behalf of himself and as manager of the second defendant, APF. Yeah. The point is, he doesn't have any right to do that because there's a BVI receivership order effectively stopping him from running proceedings on behalf of the second respondent. So that receivership order, this is a quite an unusual situation because MK, it was a freezing order against MK in the BVI. He wasn't complying with it. So on top of that, they had to make a receivership order stopping him from acting on behalf of the second respondent. And yet, despite that, He's commencing proceedings on behalf of the second respondent. It's a direct breach of that order. So these proceedings are, it, it's legally impermissible to, to apply for a stay in this court on the back of them. So it, the, the argument's untenable. But my Lord, I invite you to see the proceedings for what they actually are. They are abusive um, on many levels. Yes, and does that point uh, apply also to the application in this case? Um, Lord. In the sense that um, D2 is applying um, to um, stay these proceedings or strike them out or whatever. Um, yes, Lord. Is he acting through the um, receivers or is he oh. acting? It's instructed by the first defendant. By, by the first I mean, defendant. No, to, be, to put this correctly, um, 
he has been given the right exceptionally to defend proceedings brought against the second right. event by us. But he has not got the right. The receivers have expressly been given the right to commence proceedings. And so what he's done onshore is, is a breach. He's not allowed to do that. And that's what the order says. I can take you to it. Now, my learned friend says they disagree on that. They think he does have the right to commence proceedings against us. My submission is it, it's not it's just not open to disagreement. The order is very, very clear. The receivership order gives the receiver the right to bring legal proceedings. Can you show me? Uh, yes, no one that can. And then the relevant provision is at page 365 and it's 3H. powers given to the receivers. Yes, I see. Um, so the receivers have got the right to bring proceedings. MK has the right exceptionally to defend proceedings against him brought by us. And there was a further amendment to clarify that MK personally had the right as an exception to defend proceedings uh, brought by us, but they don't have the right to bring proceedings. Now, my learned friends, um, Evidence, I believe, says they disagree with us that they don't have the right, but it's not open to disagreement. Well, that's what the order, that's a court order, that's what it says. Um, it, it's not open for discussion, and it's it was there for a reason, my lord. And the reason was um, we had a freezing order against him, he wasn't complying with it. APF Limited, he was holding himself out on their behalf, he wasn't supposed to do it. and receivership order was, was put in place. The, the judge said he's not, he cannot be left to police himself, uh, my lord. So that's, that's my submission is these proceedings are not a defence. They're not a defence to enforcement. They are themselves abusive. And number three, they're further so, evidence. So when you say these proceedings are abusive, you mean the Dubai on board? I, I do, yes, my lord. The JJC proceedings and the onshore proceedings uh, and although there are further evidence of contempt of court, there's a sort of series of findings of dishonesty and contempt of court in EVI in Singapore. These proceedings are just a further example of that. These proceedings, meaning the Dubai and JJC proceedings. Uh, well, then finally, I would just say these legal arguments have been well known in this jurisdiction for many years. So it, it was a matter of surprise to me to see a jurisdictional objection based on a ref uh, you know onshore proceedings commenced and a JJC reference these it's been clear in this jurisdiction for nearly three years if not before that that's just simply not a ground to apply for a stay so I was surprised to see that um I my learned friends And those sitting behind him are, are well versed in these authorities, my lord, because DLA Piper, a well known firm in this jurisdiction, um, this this should not have been, this application have been made on that basis. Um, the forum non convenience, the conduit jurisdiction, and the um, JJC reference, they're just not valid legal grounds to, to, to challenge the exercise of jurisdiction in this court. Um, and that's, that's, Basically, the, the submission, Lord. Very well. Shall I hear Mr. Joseph? Mr. Joseph. Um, I can see and hear me. I can see and hear you. I'm grateful. 
Um, the, um, the central point is that in the claimant's um, submissions, um, there appears to be something of a blurring between what I would describe as gateway jurisdiction and whether this is a proper case for this court to exercise jurisdiction, to enter judgment as asserted, and whether it should do so now, picking up the point that my Lord started with. There are different points which uh, have to be made as regards the first defendant um, and uh, as regards the company. Uh, APF group in receivership. And there are different points which are raised with regard to the status of the BVI proceedings, the Singapore proceedings, and of course the uh, JJC reference. So just to clear away some uh, ground here, uh, the first is that it is not contested that um, there is uh, gateway jurisdiction, DNB makes it clear that there is gateway jurisdiction by reference to um, Article 5 and Article 7 of the JAL decree uh, and um, Article 24 of the, um, uh, uh, um, uh, the judicial authority law, which is cited in the DNB case. So none of that is disputed. It's also not disputed uh, that it is uh, not a necessary precondition to obtaining enforcement uh, in the uh, DIFC courts to show that there are assets in the DIFC. Again, that is established by the DMB case and none of that is um, uh, disputed. Um, but there are questions here of first, uh, whether this is a proper case uh, for the exercise of the jurisdiction now to enter judgment. And I will address that. Two, whether this is an abuse of uh, the process of this court. And the third, relating to the mandatory provisions of decree number 19 of 2016, that's the Article 5 uh, mandatory requirement of this court. But I need to uh, just address a, a little bit uh, of the. Um, uh, the detail first, which is what is the position in relation to the different defendants? So there is a different judgment which is being relied upon for the, they are seeking to enter different judgments for the different defendants. So I need to show you those uh, to show you that because different considerations arise in relation to each. I start with the position of the second defendant, so that's the company in receivership. And um, the irrelevant judgment. Uh, is uh, uh, at uh, page 14, uh, at least I hope that's correct. Yes, it is. Um, so if I wait for you to get there, I'm grateful. Um, so uh, it, it, it's a, a, a curious document uh, on its face and just needs, it requires a tiny bit of attention. Um, the, the, the first thing is this, that uh, it recites that a claim form has been issued, an amended statement of claim for breach of trust, dishonest assistance and knowing receipt. And then there is a second recital, which is the court finds the defendant in contempt and grants an order uh, uh, into alia that judgment of the claim shall be entered in favor of the claimant of the first defendant's uh, BVI assets. We can just we can uh, ignore the first defendant just for the moment. I'll explain why in a second. And the second defendant's worldwide assets shall be sequestered to the order and the control of the receivers, which orders are suspended for 28 days and will not be put into force if the defendant properly complies with the contempt order. And then there's the next recital that they find that they haven't complied with the contempt order. And then uh, there is a, a recital that the defendants have not appeared. And then uh, you see that uh, it is declared and ordered that uh, um, certain funds are traceable proceeds, sums uh, held in dividends are held on constructive trust. Um, and it is ordered that the defendants 
pay the sum of $95 million. You can see that at page 15, that's paragraph one. Now, just to give a tiny bit of explanation of this, um, initially in April of this year, um, Mr. Holloway's team uh, sought to enter judgment against Mr. Konoshita on the BVI judgment. Uh, but that uh, fell into difficulty because uh, Mr. Konoshita does not reside in the BVI, it didn't appear in the BVI, and uh, therefore they would find themselves facing difficulties meeting the common law requirements for the enforcement of a judgment. So instead, uh, they have abandoned that process. I'm going to come to the Singapore judgment later. Uh, but they have now proceeded to seek to enter this as a judgment against the second defendant. Now, there are uh, uh, multiple problems with this. Um, the first problem is um, it's actually completely unclear uh, what what this is um, in terms of whether this is a final and binding judgment on the merits, which, of course, is required um, on the common law test, uh, rather than a failure to um, a, a noting of the courts that they are in contempt of court and therefore they are found uh, uh, that judgment is uh, entered against them for $95 million. But there's a much uh, more uh, um, uh, um, uh, difficult obstacle for the claimant to overcome, which is that what actually this judgment is saying is that the worldwide assets of the second defendants are sequestered to the order and control of the receivers. So receivers are put in place uh, uh, to gather in the assets of the second defendant. And uh, my learned friend has shown you the receivership order, which probably bears uh, looking at. If we could just turn it up again. The receivership order um, at uh, page 365. So which paragraph is a sequestered thing in, in the order? So um, the, uh, th this is um, the second recital. Uh, the second recital refers to the fact that the assets yeah. ha shall be sequestered, and that is reflected in a um, receivership order, which, which my learned friend showed you, but I'm going to show you again. So the receivership order actually, um, I think, uh, uh, pre preceded by some years this uh, order. What page is the receivership order? So that was, um, my little friend showed uh, that it's page, it starts at 363, but I'm going to show you 365. Yeah. And so uh, we have an equitable receiver uh, appointed. Uh, uh, and at paragraph 3A, the very bottom of 364, you see that um, they remove the uh, uh, directors of the company and appoint their own. And B is to take possession of, get in, collect all assets uh, of the company, and for that purpose, to file such legal proceedings as may seem to them expedient. And then uh, uh, at little h, uh, there is the bringing of and the conduct of any litigation proceedings in relation to the company. And um, this is, you can see the rubric or the chapeau of paragraph three is that the receivers are to have these powers to be exercised worldwide. Yeah. And so the first problem that we face here relates to the second defendant. Um, uh, and this is only a point in relation to the second defendant. Um, but this is not a, a, a correct exercise of powers uh, uh, or the process of this court, the receivership order has been put in place at the claimant's uh, direction. And what then should happen is it should be the receivers that bring in the assets of D2 in all jurisdictions of the world, and that they should have the conduct of such proceedings. And it's a point not without importance, of course, because the receivers are then court-appointed um, uh, 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 officials that have a responsibility to report to the BVI court. And of course, if there are other creditors 
um, of the second defendant, then they have to be taken care of as well at the same time. And there has to be some form of mechanism for distribution, which would be under the conduct and control of the BVI court. And so what they're trying to do now is to enter a judgment and seek some form of enforcement or execution against D2, which cuts right across the regime that they themselves have put in place in the BVI courts. And, and actually, they, they, they insist, uh, 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 continually insist, that this receivership order still stands and provides a, a, a serious <laughs> obstacle to the conduct of um, the, the defence. To remind me what date the uh, judgment was as being enforced. Um, so the, the judgment which is being enforced, the BVI judgment, um, yep. it is May 22, and the, the receivership order is 2018. But the point yes. being that the point being that, that the receivership order still stands in place. I have that point. Yeah. So, so surely, surely um, the right place to take that point would be in the court on the substantive hearing of the claim in BVI. Well, well, that might might or might not be a good a good reason for refusing the order that was sought, but um, the judge granted the order. Well, the, 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 so, sorry, um, d d d d just, just to be clear, the, um, uh, the, the point that we're, we're faced with at the moment is that the claimant has put in place the receiver. There's nothing. I mean, that th 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 that is a that's a fact. That's what they have done. Yes. And um, thereafter, if there is to be a gathering in a collection of the second defendant's assets, it has to be within the regime that the claimants themselves have put in place, and that is the 2018 order. I it that. wouldn't be a point for it wouldn't be a point for the BVI courts because the BVI courts has made its order. Uh, thereafter, it would be for the receivers. The BVI court could have been presented with an argument on behalf of the second defendants that you had the wrong plaintiffs, wrong claimants, because the uh, receiver had been appointed and it was the receiver's job to get in all the assets. And well, you could have said, don't, please, therefore, don't make an order against the second defendants in the name of the claimants. But that... There is an original judgment uh, which uh, uh, appears uh, to be the order at pages 14 and 15. Yes. Um, and um, our complaint is not that this order uh, has been made for what it is worth, but rather the steps which are now taken uh, to either enforce or collect in or gather the assets of D2, which has to be a process of the receivers rather than the claimant. That's not a point that we could have taken or anyone could have taken in the BVI court, because, of course, that's a year or more prior to the bringing of any proceedings in um, the Dubai courts, in the DIC courts. Couldn't you have gone to the D B BVI court, going back to the judgment of page 14 15, couldn't you have gone to the BVI court and said, uh, these proceedings are unfounded because the claimants whatever what they call them claimants um, have already had a receiver appointed over the assets and that is the means they should the, the means they should take of recovering their their, their alleged debt couldn't you have asked the bbi judge to refuse the order i i i don't know if that's possible the, the, this order appears to be consequent upon a finding of contempt uh, that's what appears from the recital um and um so I, I don't know what the precise state of the law is in the bvi on this but of course there's a lot of authority in the english courts about um whether you can defend yourself until you've purged and so on and so forth um i don't know what the position was in the bvi at that at the time that this is uh, entered but but the point mm -hmm. that we make is a slightly different one the fact Sorry. is that the judge, the BVI judge, knew about the receivership. Correct. Yes. Yes, absolutely. He recites it. Yeah, and he nonetheless ordered that the defendants pay the claimant that sum of ninety-five million dollars. But th this is that that we are now involved in a process where the uh, uh, claimant is seeking to take control of a process of 
enforcement and execution when that should be a process of the receivers because of the terms of the receivership order that I've, I've shown you. So can you remind me where this is in your skeleton argument? Uh, this isn't in the skeleton argument. Why not? Um, my Lord, I, I apologise, um, but it, 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 it isn't. Question of apologies, question of fair notice to the other party. You've come here to court to resist an order and to seek to uh, dismiss the enforcement proceedings. Uh, you have shown no sign in your skeleton argument uh, that there's any substantive point taken against the enforcement of the orders as opposed to what we might call discretionary jurisdictional points. Why should, why should I hear an argument of this sort? Well, I think it does go to di di dis discretion as well, because it's, it makes, it's not a ground put forward. Why should I why should I um, listen to it now? Well, um, it, it, it arises out of documents that my learned friend places very considerable reliance on. And I think it's only fair. I mean, he places a lot of reliance in his submissions on whether it is right for the defendant to come to this court as opposed to the receiver. And I make a more substantive point in response yes. to that. I, 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 why, didn't, why didn't you make it in your skeleton argument? Then he could have dealt with it. Well, I, 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 I can't say more than, than I've already said. I don't think I should hear this. I'm prepared to deal with the points that are raised in the skeleton arguments and on any court documents. Right. Well, I mean, I, I think this is a point which arises from the court documents and indeed actually arises from the points of my love. But I, I can't press it further no, than that. It's not a point that's made fairly. We've had plenty of notice of this application. Yes. I understand. I understand. Um, the, the point in relation to uh, where we stand in relation to the first defendant, um, I think that uh, you, my lord started off with a question to my learned friend, which is, uh, well, where are the where have the Singapore pleadings got to? If I can yeah. show um, my lord the uh, evidence on that, uh, and if this is a uh, an affidavit which came in yesterday uh, from our side in response to the affidavit from the uh, other side in relation to Singapore. You can find it at page 2232 and following in the bundle. 2232. Yes, and then that's the start of the document. And then I wanted to show you uh, yeah. paragraph 20 and following. Hold on a second, I can't do this on the PDF because I downloaded it before it came in. Ah. To, uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll find it a different way. Right, I have two, two, three, two. So, um, do, do, you, do you then turn to paragraph twenty, which is under the heading of Singapore proceedings? Yep. So, um, uh, what uh, you you should note uh, is that the notice of appeal, which my learned friend um, rightly accepts is an appeal as of right, was filed on the nineteenth of April. Um, the st a stay of execution has not been granted, and uh, uh, my learned friend is uh, quite right to emphasise that. Um, we had uh, m said uh, to, uh, in our skeleton argument, something which was uh, incorrect, and we sincerely apologise for that. We, the instructions we had was the stay of application had not been heard, uh, but we have corrected that at paragraph 27 of the affidavit. And I'm uh, very, very sorry uh, that that uh, uh, inaccuracy uh, was stated in our skeleton. But the um, uh, w what we uh, have uh, said here is that um, that a provisional liquidator has now been appointed uh, over uh, group lease holdings. But the uh, Court of Appeal will hear uh, the uh, the case, the appeal on the. Uh, in a window between the 20th of November and the 1st of December of this year. That's paragraph 30. And so um, 
the, the first point that needs to be made in relation to the position of, of, of the first defendant is that uh, even if there is gateway jurisdiction to enter uh, judgment, uh, this uh, court uh, should not, uh, it, the, the, the jurisdiction in relation to D1 is only in respect to the, the Singapore judgment, is not in relation to the B5 yeah. judgment. And so because of the imminency of the appeal, uh, the, this court should exercise its discretion <clears throat> uh, to uh, adjourn the question of the entry of judgment against D1 until that appeal has been uh, heard and determined. My learned friend says, well, there is no um, stay of execution in Singapore. Um, but that really cuts both ways, because then that leads to a point that we've made repeatedly in our skeleton about um, uh, uh, multiplicity of enforcement proceeding, proceedings, which uh, basically are just designed to um, uh, uh, end up vexing uh, the first defendant uh, whilst he is in the process of appealing the judgment, which is supposed to give rise to the entry of the judgment. Um, it, it, it's not a very attractive position that the uh, claimant uh, appears to be wishing to take such steps as cross-examination of the judgment debtor and so on, uh, when there is an appeal which is due to be heard in only a matter of two, three months, or three months. That appeal will be on the basis of the facts found in the court below, won't it? I, I, I have to say I'm not um, sufficiently uh, 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 on top of what the appeal, uh, the grounds of appeal are, and and uh, to what extent that uh, there is an appeal on fact as well as appeal on law. But presumably, whether there's appeal on fact or law, it won't involve rehearing all the evidence. Uh, I'm sure I, that's right. I imagine the procedure is similar to that, which would take would happen in England, uh, that the unless there's some particular passage in the evidence uh, which needs to be trawled through. Um, the appeal mainly be on findings of fact and of the findings of law and um, possibly fact, but without the need for any further witnesses. Yes, and there, presumably there'd be questions of whether whether or not there was an evidential basis for certain findings yeah. in the court, presumably. So therefore, therefore cross-examination of anyone on your behalf um, in enforcement proceedings won't have any impact on the preparation for the appeal. I mean, I, I can see I can see the point that my lord makes, which is it's, it's not a question of, uh, of of whether or not that the same legal team would be involved in the preparation of one and the other at the same time. It, it, it's not so much that, but 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 clearly uh, the, um, the the claimant is uh, hell bent on subjecting D one, uh, not just to cross examination on assets, but also to a travel ban. Can I just show you that in the affidavit of um, Mr. Wisdom Dagger. Yeah. That's at paragraphs 13 to 19. If I could just ask um, my Lord just to read that through very uh, quickly. Uh, that on the 17th of, this is paragraph 17, the 17th of July, the claimant obtained a travel ban against the first defendant in connection with the execution proceedings, uh, with the travel ban being registered under number 920 uh, backslash 2023. Um, a grievance has been filed uh, against that uh, under number 1342023. So uh, what appears to be the case is that pending an appeal uh, in Singapore, uh, the first defendant is being subjected not just to the worldwide freeze, freezing order, uh, but um, which, which uh, d does, can, can of course remain in place and has been adhered to, uh, but wishes to impose travel bans, cross-examination, and all in relation to a position where there are no assets in this jurisdiction, whilst at the same time, the, the, the Singapore judgment is being, you know, uh, uh, appealed and will, that appeal will be heard in, in, in three months' time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's keep, a question. Sorry. You keep saying there are no assets in the DIFC. You may be right, may be wrong, but why should the claimants accept your word for it? Well, it, it's not a word, it is um, an affidavit, uh, which they have called for. They have uh, asked for a worldwide freezing order. They, and they, they, have, called. they don't have to accept the truth of it. I'm not saying it's true or false, but there's no reason that the claimant should just uh, assume that uh, what, what's said is true. 
No, but the 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 uh, the normal course for that, uh, and the more normal route for that, um, and it would be that um, if there are grounds, and I say if because there aren't, but if there are grounds to to suggest that there's been a breach of the worldwide freezing order, uh, a, a, a lack of uh, a, 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 um, candor in the affidavit of assets, there are there's machinery uh, for the enforcement of a worldwide freezing order. Yeah. Uh, so, so really, um, there is a, 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 a point of discretion here uh, as to whether it is right uh, to subject the first defendant to these multiple overlapping processes, which include, actually, a restriction on his freedom uh, to travel uh, at the same time as the judgment done in Singapore is, 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 is under appeal um, for, and, um, and, and, and so forth. Um, the, there is no real prejudice uh, to the um, p position of the claimant in that in that regard, because uh, the worldwide freezing order would remain in place. There's machinery for the enforcement of that order. If they had grounds to suggest there had been a breach of that order, which we say there isn't, um, and then the registration of the judgment, the entry of a judgment, would uh, come back to this court. Um, at the earliest stage after the Court of Appeal has uh, disposed of the matter. Now, that would be, we submit, uh, the right way of approaching the law after DMB, because, of course, you, you will appreciate that the DMB case is not authority for the proposition that, uh, despite the fact there's a gateway jurisdiction, it will always be appropriate to enter judgment and to do so immediately. Um, indeed, the DMB case... Um, at the back end of the judgment, if you go to page 1587, which is the start of the judgment. Um, if you look at, if you take up um, the uh, discussion at page 1610, paragraph 130 and following. Um, the Court of Appeal uh, 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 first cited uh, the well-known expression of Lord Bingham in the Attorney General versus Barker case. We, we have that in the bundles. I don't think we need to look it up. Uh, that using a process for a purpose or in a way significantly different from its ordinary proper use um, uh, is uh, how abusive process is defined. And there's reference to Hunter. Uh, and the Chief Constable of West Midlands Police, where Lord Diplock explained that the circumstances which a, in which an abusive process occurred are varied and not limited to fixed categories. And then a finding of abuse depends on whether it would be manifestly unfair to a party or would bring the administration of justice into disrepute. We, we are talking here about whether it's manifestly unfair to a party. Um, the, in, in this case, uh, the Court of Appeal concluded the response have not demonstrated that the enforcement of the English order would be manifestly unfair to them. Um, the recognition and enforcement of the English order would not bring the administration of justice to disrepute. The appellant has not brought any vexatious proceedings on this matter by concurrently pursuing several enforcements of the same order in different jurisdictions. In fact, there is benefit obtainable by the appellant once it obtains a local judgment and recognition of the enforcement order. Um, this is not a situation where the game is not worth the candle or that the judicial and court resources are not used appropriately and proportionately. Now, of course, every case has to be looked at on its own facts. Here you've got these overlapping questions of enforcement and jurisdiction uh, at, a, at a time when an appeal is very, very shortly to be heard. Uh, the imposition of a restriction on someone's personal liberty and freedom uh, by way of the travel ban order. Uh, there are very different circumstances in play in this case, uh, and also the shorts of the time, and the protection of the worldwide freezing order. You'll remember that one of the points which was raised in the DMB case was that it might be, uh, uh, it, it is legitimate to use the enforcement proceeding uh, as a means uh, you can have give that teeth by virtue of obtaining a WWFO. Well, the claimants have obtained the WWFO against the first defendant, and so it has obtained what it is legitimate to obtain, and there's a mechanism for the enforcement of that. So that's what we would say in relation to abuse of process and so forth, um, and whether this is a proper case for the exercise of jurisdiction at this particular time, um, uh, and you have those submissions. In relation to uh, the 
uh, Article 5 of the 2016 uh, decree. Um, yeah. the, the, the point uh, we could, say could, could, is, could sorry. Show me, can you show me Article 5? Yes, of course I can. Um, so uh, I've written down tab 33, which is not helpful to you, but it's page 2077, which is helpful. Maybe. Yes, it is helpful. Um, so uh, this is the decree. Um, it's uh, short and sweet. Um, uh, the um, Article 5 refer, talks about the effect of referral of the dispute to the Judicial Tribunal. Uh, there has been a referral of the dispute to the Judicial Tribunal. My learned friend has uh, shown you that. Um, uh, 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 it shall result in the following either a discontinuation of the proceedings in the cases or claims on which a conflict of jurisdiction has arisen, pending a decision of the Judicial Tribunal, um, or stay of execution of conflicting judgments pending the determination of the applicable judgment. In this case, we're dealing with sub one, um, uh, unless there was to be the entry of a judgment and then stay of execution. So at this stage, it would be subparagraph one, but if you enter judgment, it would be then subparagraph two, a stay of execution uh, pending the determination. Um, the, my learned friend says, well, there hasn't really been um, a referral, a proper referral to uh, the uh, JJC. Um, we do not agree with that. Um, Tell the, me, just go to article five for a moment. Yes, of course. What do you say is the conflict of jurisdiction? Well, the, the conflict of jurisdiction. The onshore Dubai courts have refused jurisdiction for whatever reason. Yes. There's been no ruling in this court on jurisdiction. What is the conflict? Well, so um, just dealing with that in stages. The first thing is that the um, uh, if we go back to the affidavit of Mr. Wissam Dagger, it gives the uh, updated chronology. I probably should have shown you that. It's paragraph 6 to 12 of Mr. Dagger's um, um, witness statement. Right. Let me just read so, it. So um, that is uh, page 2232 of the following. Yeah. So I think we'll start at 2233, bottom paragraph 6. So the claim was filed on the on the 11th of May. That's paragraph 6. Yeah. Um, and um, they sought declarations um, uh, that uh, they are released of reliability to the claimant based on false accusations filed against them in various jurisdictions, including the BVI judgment and the second Singapore judgment, um, and compensation and costs. Yeah. The um, uh, 12th of July, uh, my lawyer is absolutely right, said the Court of First Instance onshore decided um, during a hearing held that day, uh, ruled that it lacked jurisdiction. So my lord is absolutely right to say that. Yeah. Uh, and then that has been appealed uh, to the Court of Appeal on the 11th of August. And um, it looks as though uh, that there is now a further hearing uh, for judgment on the 13th of September 2023. So that's really only a matter of days away. The right. Court of Appeal is going to give its decision. Um, as to uh, the jurisdiction of the Dubai onshore courts. So um, there would be, um, we say, uh, every sense in uh, awaiting the outcome of the Court of Appeal in Dubai. Uh, that's only consistent with questions of comity. Uh, the courts onshore and DISC have to work very, very closely together in this context. Um, and that is reinforced by the provisions of Articles 4 and 5 of the decree. Mr. Joseph, the question I asked you there was, what is presently the conflict? Is there a conflict at present? Well, you, you mean prior to a ruling from the Court of Appeal? Yes, today. Yeah, well, the, I, mean, the, I have to, I, I mean, absolutely, the, the position is that jurisdiction was not was not taken up by the courts, and so it would only be on the ruling of the Court of Appeal. So there is no basis at the moment, today, as of today. We'll forget as about of tomorrow. today, that's right. There's no basis for a reference to the JJC. 
Yeah, I, I, my lord, I have to accept that that is the position today. But we, it is, it is um, only six days away that it's expected there to be um, a ruling from the Court of Appeal. And rather than having this matter come back in terms of stays of execution and so on and so forth, the sensible process we would submit would be for this the question of uh, uh, enforcement against D1 to be adjourned either until the outcome of the Court of Appeal, see first head of submissions, or uh, until the outcome of the Court of Appeal in, in Dubai on shore. Right, just ask me a separate separate question. Um, well, two or three questions, actually. <laughs> um, if there's no basis, no conflict of jurisdiction at, at the moment, what was the basis on which you lodged your application or filed your application with the JJC? It, uh, um, I, I, I think the, the chrono the, that that doesn't work on the, the chronology. The chronology was we filed the Dubai onshore proceedings. I think on the um, uh, sorry the eleventh of the eleventh of May. Yeah. Uh, and it was the the um, the we filed our um, dispute of jurisdiction in this court at a time when the Dubai onshore proceedings were standing and yes, had what, not been dismissed for lack of Maybe I didn't the, understand the question. What was the conflict of jurisdiction there? Ah, what, so, so, so can we go back to the, um, the, the JJC don't, application? Don't take me to a document. Just tell me in your own words. Let's assume you have a position. That yes. the, the onshore Dubai court had not yet reached a decision. Yes. The, there'd be an application to this court for enforcement. What was the conflict of jurisdiction at that stage? The conflict was whether or not it is for this court or the Dubai courts uh, to uh, uh, seize the questions of, of... Mr. Of, Joseph, that's the question that might arise. But what was the conflict that had to be resolved? There was no conflict. The Dubai courts hadn't ruled. This court hadn't ruled. Where's the conflict? Uh, it, it, it is based on the application for a judgment from the claimants on the footing that this court does have jurisdiction. Yes. And the uh, Dubai court hasn't been asked to say this court doesn't have jurisdiction. It, 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 it is. It is. It is being asked to say that, that this is a matter of the Dubai courts and not the DIFC courts. Well, the Dubai court has been asked to to rule on that. Yes. Not the JJC, but the Dubai court. Um. Sorry, just give me two seconds. Uh, I'm trying. Um, just try and get you the reference. Give me two seconds. Now, I think it is the application to the JJC that I was referring to, uh, paragraph 40. Yes, but what I'm asking about is what the conflict of jurisdiction was between the DIFC on the one hand and the onshore yes. Dubai court on the other hand. And I think you accept there is no present conflict. But was there ever a conflict until ruling, conflicting rulings came out, which they haven't yet? Uh, well, I, I think that if you uh, start at page 160, which is the Dubai claim. Yes. Um, that uh, th this is a translation. Um, one six. Uh, one six zero. One six zero. What, what uh, is recited in the uh fact section is yeah. that um there are a series of agreements uh investment agreements to buy convertible debentures of the value of 210 million dollars see paragraph three and then those 
agreements are recited. And then um, uh, there is a recital of the fact that the claimant resigned its position, its position as CEO of the Group Lease Public Company Limited and so forth. And then the claimant had nothing to do with the fall in the share price of the Group Lease Public Company Limited, paragraph seven. And then in paragraph eight, final judgments were issued in several countries confirming the truth, that is the defendant voluntarily chose to make business investments in existing listed companies and no fraud was committed. Um, and then the claimant is entitled to file this action seeking a judgment to release and acquit him from the $210 million, which constitutes the alleged value of the defendant's investments in Group Lease Public Company Limited. Yeah. Um, and, and then there is reference to the various uh, uh, actions uh, in uh, across the world in uh, Thailand and Cambodia and so on and so forth. And then ultimately saying that the defendant is being asked to release from liability. But if my Lord is asking a question, does this Dubai claim in some way itself assert that the DIFC has no jurisdiction? I have to be uh, quite clear in saying that no, it doesn't. Right. So that having helpfully taken me through the narrative of the Dubai court proceedings, you ca you cannot say there is there was then a conflict between the well, two. It, it is implied. It is well, implied. Sorry, I apologize. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You can't say it. <clears throat> there was no, certainly no express conflict between the Dubai proceedings and the DIFC proceedings as as regards jurisdiction. Uh, there is a co conflict, and uh, can, I, can I explain? Because um, what what uh, is uh, the, the thrust of the DIFC um, application is that the DIFC courts have jurisdiction and should enforce a judgment of 125 million in relation to this subject matter, which the the, the uh, first defendant in the Dubai proceedings is saying he has no liability in respect of. Yes, that's that's a liability question rather than a jurisdiction question. I mean, he, your 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 client is saying that he asked the Dubai court not to recognise the foreign judgments because they, they are de defective in one way or another. Yes, he's not. Um, he's not, as I understand it, saying anything about DIFC. The, the DISC is not mentioned in, in, in directly. In the, it's not mentioned directly in the Dubai proceedings. I, 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 I accept that. So the simple position is your client, as as he may be entitled to, may not be. I, I, it's not for me to judge. Has gone to Dubai court and said, please don't recognise these judgments. And then has gone to the JJC to say we uh, there is a clash of jurisdictions because each is yes, uh, but... really governing the same subject matter and the outcome, the resolution of that is going to be heard, uh, 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 we say, very shortly following the ruling from the Dubai uh, at, Court of Appeal on 13th of September. At present, though, there is no conflict of jurisdiction between the Dubai courts and the DIFC courts. For, for the reason that I mentioned earlier, that, that because the, there has the been Dubai a, court, There never has been as yet. Well, I don't accept there never has been, but I accept that, that the Dubai court... To one. Oh, so, I'm certain. so you can't point me to any conflict? Of yeah, well, I, I, I've i tried to explain how we read the Dubai claim, but I, I understand that my learned friend um, um, makes an argument which says that, that until you have actually identified a specific clash between the Dubai courts and the DIFC courts from the Dubai proceedings themselves. But I, I think it is there because each is dealing with exactly the same subject matter and the same liabilities. Well, tell me this, what would be wrong with enforcement in two different courts? Why, why is there a jurisdictional problem there? It's commonplace, I think, for people to go wherever they think the money is or wherever well, they think, well, or wherever they think they'll get an advantage. Um, uh, no, no, not, not when the actual liability itself is being challenged. It's not being challenged in these proceedings. Well, well, it, it is, my lord, because in, big, in, big, application, in your application, you don't raise a single word about the uh, enforceability of the judgments in Singapore and um, BVI. Well, the, the, sorry, 
what 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 I said earlier was that the, the Court of Appeal is going to be hearing the appeal of the Singapore proceedings, and it's not um, yes, appropriate. You, you don't. To, to I, I, I understand the discretion point uh, as to whether I should simply adjourn these that part of the proceedings, but um, you don't in these proceedings challenge the judgment on its face, apart from saying. Um, please wait until the Court of Appeal is determined. That's correct. So it's, That's not a case, correct. it's not a case where you say no jurisdiction of the BB, of the Singapore Court, no, um, and so on. Correct. And that, that is correct. And that was the distinction between the first lot of enforcement proceedings which relied on the BVI judgment, and then the second Singapore judgment came along. Um, okay. yeah. Leave aside the Court of Appeal point, which I understand. Yes. Um, what, you've got the judgments in BVI and Singapore against different defendants, or yes. forced by different defendants. What is wrong with going to two or three different jurisdictions and saying, please enforce these? If there is a, 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 some basis for thinking it, it is um, to your advantage. Well, um, you, you, this goes back over the submissions I made about um, overlapping um, enforcement proceedings, um, and, and I've made those submissions, uh, and I don't necessarily want to repeat them. I mean, the fact is they've got a WWFO, they have their protection now, the Court of Appeal is going to pronounce, um, and uh, there are there's no evidence of any assets in this jurisdiction. If they did have evidence of assets and that we had misdescribed what the position is, they, there is machinery for enforcement to the WWFO, which is which is in place and will remain in place. Okay. I don't think I can say more, more uh, no, in relation to that. The reason I was asking that was I was trying to find out whether in your submission, the mere existence of two sets of enforcement proceedings in different jurisdictions, DIFC and Dubai, um, meant there was a conflict of jurisdiction. I don't see it myself. Not, not the mere existence, no. Okay. So if the Dubai Appeal Court um, ruled that there was jurisdiction after all, and therefore there was jurisdiction in Dubai, that mere fact wouldn't mean there was a conflict of jurisdiction with the DIFC. Well, it, it, it would um, in, in these in on these facts, it would do because um, uh, what what uh, ultimately then is going to be in play is a set of proceedings in Dubai which are going to. Uh, examine whether or not there is liability and um, it, until that is resolved one way or the other there shouldn't be execution or enforcement of these judgments. I see. Okay. W wh where do we go next? I, I mean I think that's really um, all, all there is you know that that's the ground that we've covered in our skeleton which yeah. you've um, you know sort of obviously read and taken on board. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm very grateful. Um, Mr. Can Hall I just, just check my uh, WhatsApp messages? Because sometimes the team say I've, I've got it all wrong. Well, actually, it's not sometimes, it can't happen often. Just Yes, I mean, I think I think that the, a point which um, I, I probably should I, I think I have already made, but just to re-emphasize is that um, it is abusive uh, to use the DIFC court um, uh, jurisdiction somehow to enforce a travel ban um, on a restriction of movement uh, on this defendant in, in, on shore. And if they are going to proceed in that way, then they, they, the correct mechanism for that should be to proceed through a process through the Dubai courts and not the DIFC courts. Who, who imposed the travel ban? Was it the DIFC court or the DIFC authorities? No, it, it's it, 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 if, if you um, if you go back to um, uh, the uh, affidavit of Mr. Wissam Dagger, yeah. it's um, it is the Dubai courts. It's not the um, it's not the DIFC courts.
So, right, but how does that then um, come into this application? Well, I think I think it's part of what I was saying earlier about the you know abusive process, uh, uh, the abusive process that is taking place here, and um, I mean, it, obviously the facts will, will you know the, you have the facts. Um, it doesn't paint a very pretty picture, is the honest truth. There is a um, uh, uh, there are different uh, procedures that they could have adopted uh, to seek enforcement in. Dubai, if that's what they really, really wanted to do to obtain a travel ban of some sort, but they've decided not to go through that route. Um, and uh, now we have brought proceedings in the Dubai courts to challenge what they're doing. And the, and the JJC is going to, uh, we say, um, ultimately resolve a clash of jurisdictions. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else on your WhatsApps? Uh, no, I think that was it. <laughs> there, there are, there's more, but but but. <laughs> right, uh, Mr. Holloway, was there anything you wanted to come back on? Uh, briefly, uh, Lord, and I'll check my WhatsApp as well at the end, if I may. Um, but in terms of the the Court of Appeal procedure and your lordship was asking about the you know whether there would be cross-examination witnesses and things like that if i could just explain that the, the the first singapore judgment came about after a trial um, where mk and others gave evidence were cross-examined and so on and so forth um, the court of appeal decision was a review of that um, without live evidence and so on and so forth and there were various findings of dishonesty and so on in that first procedure. Um, the second Singapore proceedings, which led to the judgment which we're enforcing today or trying to enforce today, basically was based on the findings of the first proceedings. So uh, those findings of deceit, dishonesty, uh, unlawful conspiracy, etc., were the foundation of the second Singapore uh, judgment. That was a summary procedure. There was only one outstanding issue, which was quantum arising out of one of the investment agreements. And so what the, the Singapore court held is that all the facts have been finally determined by the Singapore Court of Appeal, except the damages question. And judgment was entered for 124 million odd based on the original findings of fact as reviewed by the Singapore Court of Appeal, etc. So there's very limited reviewing left to be done in that appeal procedure. Um, I'm not sure how my learned friend uh, and, and his clients are putting the appeal, but the factual position has been finally resolved and determined uh, in the first proceedings. Th those have all been recognised as final and binding by the Court of Appeal. Um, there's no room to challenge any of that in the appeal. Um, that's just one procedural point on that award. Then secondly, recognise from my learned friend's submissions that he's actually not putting forward any defences to enforcement uh, of either judgment um, as in answer to your Lordship's question. So he's not arguing there was no substantive jurisdiction, he's not arguing the common law defences to enforcement, he's not arguing fraud, he's not arguing breach of public policy. So there's no actual defence to this claim at all, apart from the abuse of process argument um, and the the idea that these proceedings on shore somehow should result in uh, not proceeding to judgment today. Uh, well, Lord, I don't want to go through the authorities anymore. You, you, you've, you've asked my learned friend the question. There is no conflict. Um, the JJC procedure is designed to resolve actual conflicts, clashes of judgments, not potential overlapping proceedings. The key to that is the language of Article 4. Oh Lord, um, I'll just go back to that very briefly. Of the treaty. Uh, of the decree, the JJC decree. Yeah. Um, that is it's the introductory wording, isn't it? 2077. Yes, oh. it's the introductory wording. Um, the event of conflict of jurisdiction, as none yeah. of the courts yes. gave up in the case, or all the courts have given up. Yeah, yes, 
And then it's in the event of a conflict is the first qualification. Yeah. And then secondly, um, the the conflict or the dispute, as it's called, shall be referred to the JJC. There are different translations of it. But what is required is that first there is a conflict between the courts or the decisions of those courts. And it's that dispute or conflict that needs to be referred to the JJC. So the fact that there may be a potential overlap between proceedings is not something that you can refer to the JJC. There needs to be a conflict. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, yes, can we go to Article 5, Karim? It, Article 5 then says the referral of the dispute to the Judicial Tribunal, and that's Lacan and all the other cases clarify that that wording requires a conflict. It's not that you can refer any old case to the JJC. You, you, you refer a dispute between courts, an active, inconsistent decision of two courts gets put to the JJC for resolution. So it's not it's not you just refer your case to the JJC or refer some potential or anticipated conflict. It has to be a conflict, there has to be conflicting decisions. Um, and all the case law says that. Well, I took it to the relevant passages in Lacan. Um, it goes back to the um, standard chartered uh, investment group private case where they actually said it has to be an active conflict not an anticipated conflict. So there's nothing in that, my Lord. And I'm, it's, it's settled law. I repeat the points that I made about the, the nature of this um, conflict. And then just, I think, what this has boiled down to, this very expensive um, series of applications and so on, is that my learning friend says, well, let's just have a bit more time um, and wait and see what happens either in Dubai. Well. They're not asking Dubai to wait, are they? They're asking you to wait, um, and that's that's just not the way it works. But in terms of waiting for the Singapore appeal, um, well, Lord, that, that's also not the way it works. Um, and I'll just take you to, I mean, this is Dicey and Morris, we've both referred to it, but a judgment is enforceable if final and binding, even if an appeal is pending. Um, my Lord, there's no stay of execution. And my Lord, the only power that the court has is an equitable power to stay execution of a judgment. My Lord, first admission is the defendants here don't deserve the, the, the equitable jurisdiction or discretion to be exercised in their favour. Um, and, and secondly, um, this is something that can be resolved at the execution stage. So if there's any sense uh, you know, of assets being seized in an irrevocable way, that's something that can be raised at the execution stage. The cross-examination of a judgment debtor, there's absolutely no reason for that process to wait. Um, my Lord, this is, um, these judgments resulted from a huge fraud. It's hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and well, I have that point. Etc. Uh, my Lord, we 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 are. Mr. Adachi makes it clear in terms of his motive. His motive is to find the assets and use them to satisfy the outstanding debt. Um, these processes may help us to do that. Um, the quicker we do it, the better. Um, so, my Lord, that's my submission. Going back to your first point about the Singapore appeal being very limited. Did I gather from that that effectively what's an issue there is precise quantum rather than anything else? Well, well, well it's it's quantum. It's a big quantum. It, it is the third tranche, basically. Um, the, there, there were three investment agreements. The first set of proceedings found that they'd all been procured by deceit, dishonesty, etc. Damages on two of the agreements fell due, but not the third one. The second proceedings were all about the third one. Um, Learned friend and his clients argued that we can re-argue this. The Singapore court said no, this has all been decided apart from quantum. Um, that's the only issue. Um, it's a big quantum, it's a big claim. Um, mm -hmm. and there, there may be other points that he may wish to raise, but the underlying fi findings of fact 
were the basis of the second judgment. That, that came from the original trial as reviewed and found by the Court of Appeal. Res judicata, I can take you to those findings, my Lord. There's a litany of findings of dishonesty, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's, you know, I, I, I can see, of course, the appeal may come in all shapes and sizes. It's very unlikely that they're going to get around a Court of Appeal final decision on all those facts. Um, yes. So, yes. Very well. Um, is there anything else you wanted to raise? No, no. Mr. Joseph, I saw you being uh, anxious at one point. Did you want to say uh, something? Just that we don't accept the appealers on quantum. Is it? Very well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give my decision um, in, a, in about um, an hour's time. And it won't be very lengthy reasoning, but it will um, deal with the matters before me. So what I can ask you to do is to, I, w I don't recommend um, exiting the system because we may have a problem getting back in again. But if you just mute, mute yourselves and turn your cameras off, I'll do the same and we can resume. Uh, can we at um, quarter to, I'm working on UK time. Uh, at 11.45, which is 2.45 um, DIFC time. Saeed, are you there? Yes, don't you? Uh, we're going to, I'm going to, we're all going to mute ourselves now and yes. come back at, um, in three quarters of an hour, just about at quarter to, quarter to two. The, I'll keep the recording and the uh, link open. Thank you very much. Sure. OK. Thank you. Bro. Is the system working? Said, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, is everything fine? Everyone can hear each other? Yep, I think so. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is give an oral judgment, which Said, can you get it typed up in due course? And yes. on the Thank you. This action is brought by the claimants to enforce two judgments. The first is a Singapore judgment, uh, known as the second Singapore judgment, issued on the 17th of April 2023 against the first defendant and others in the sum of uh, over 124 million US dollars and costs and interest. The second is a BVI judgment issued on the 6th of May 2022 against the 2022. Yeah. Against the second defendant and others in the sum of uh, US dollars 95 million plus plus interest. To avoid jurisdictional disputes, the Claimants seek to enforce a Singapore judgment only against the first defendant in these proceedings and the BVI judgment only against the second defendant. The Singapore judgment is under appeal in Singapore. The appeal is apparently to be heard sometime between 20th November and 1st December of this year. But it's important to note that the Singapore Court of Appeal has refused an application by the, by the defendants for a stay of execution pending appeal. The applications before me are twofold. One is by the claimants for immediate judgment on their claim to enforce the two judgments. The second is by the defendants and their application is to dismiss or uh, failing that to stay these proceedings. No substantive defence to enforcement has been advanced by either defendant in this court. But it is said that it is not appropriate to enforce the judgment in the DIFC, that it is an abusive process. In any event, the present claim should be stayed because the onshore Dubai court has jurisdiction in this matter and the reference has been made to the JJC for 
the matter of jurisdiction to be determined. So far as the argument is concerned that this is not the time to enter judgment, that is a point <clears throat> relating to the Singapore judgment, to the fact that the Singapore judgment is under appeal. It is said that in exercise of, of the court's discretion, it would be wrong to enforce that judgment and the court should adjourn the application to see what happens in the appeal. There is no dispute that as a matter of law, the judgment is enforceable even though it is under appeal. And it's relevant that the Singapore court has refused a stay of execution. In these circumstances, it seems to me that it would be wrong to delay enforcement proceedings here. The, enforce, the refusal of a stay of execution is an important factor to my mind. So far as abuse of process is concerned, it's now accepted, although it wasn't earlier, that the DIFC courts have jurisdiction to enforce the judgments under Articles 5 and 7 of the Judicial Authority Law and under Article 24 of the Courts Law, even if it's not shown that, even if there is not shown to be any assets within the DIFC. The use of the DIFC as a conduit to jurisdiction is well established and approved by the Court of Appeal in the DMB case, 2015 Court of Appeal 007. <clears throat> but as Mr. Joseph KC points out, that case does not in any, in any case say that there will always be appropriate to enforce, uh, to use that jurisdiction. It depends on the circumstances, but there's nothing in the circumstances here to make it inappropriate, in my view. The defendants rely on proceedings commenced by them in Dubai, in the Dubai courts, to challenge the judgments. So far as onshore Dubai courts have, so far the onshore Dubai courts have declined jurisdiction. I'm told that the, the matter has gone to the Dubai Court of Appeal and, and the judgment is expected next week. So be it. I have to deal with the position as it is now. In any event, I'm not satisfied that the decision of the Dubai Court to accept jurisdiction, if that's the decision it came to, would it make any difference? There is nothing inherently wrong with judge, a judgment creditor such as the claimants seeking to enforce a judgment in more than one jurisdiction that does not necessarily give rise to any conflict or difficulty. The defendants say the matter has been referred to the JJC in terms of Dubai Decree number 19 of 2016, and that there should be therefore a stay of the DIFC proceedings in terms of Article 5 of that decree. I do not accept that. There is, as noted already, no present conflict of jurisdiction between the courts of the DIFC and those of onshore Dubai, that was accepted. Nor will there necessarily, in my view, be any conflict of jurisdiction, even if the Dubai Court of Appeal allows the appeal. As I've said, there's no reason why you should not have enforcement in more than one place. In the circumstances, there's no basis for this court staying the enforcement proceedings. And I refer to Lacan against Lamia, 2021 Court of Appeal, Zero, zero, 001. In all the circumstances, therefore, I shall refuse the defendant's application and grant the claimant's application. And uh, is there any submission to be made as regards costs? Yes, <clears throat> my lord. Um, we've we, we've received our costs today. Um, we filed a schedule. It's at page two two zero zero. Bear with me a moment. Two two zero zero. Yes, my lord. And just before I take you into that, I'll be asking for costs on an indemnity basis today. Um, right. for two reasons. Um, first, the jurisdiction application was spurious. Um, my lord, you asked my learned friend whether there was a conflict. He couldn't find one, so they should never have made that application in the first place. Uh, it was contrary to long-standing authority uh, in, in, in this court. 
Uh, secondly, um, the, 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 the Dubai proceedings and the JJC proceedings, in my submission, I've made the submission earlier, my Lord, were abusive attempts to undermine and delay judgment being entered. Um, I'll not repeat the, the detail of it, but uh, I'll just leave it there, my Lord. Right. Do you want to show me your statement of costs? Yes. Uh, Asking me to assess costs. Yes, my lord. The, the hearing lasted less than a day. You have the you have the right to assess. Yeah. We have the obligation to assist you in doing so. Um, the grand total is at page two two one. Um, hefty amount of that, I should say, are court fees. This is a big judgment, and one has to pay a fee dependent on the amount in question. Um, my, learned, my learned friend at the last hearing insisted that we make a separate Part 7 application. We had to incur that, that court fee. I, I'm not making any repeating the point, but that, that's quite a large figure, and, and the total figure is 871,000 dirham. So we broke it down as best we could. It's about £150,000 in sterling. Yep. Yes. <clears throat> um, you've got three people appearing at the hearing today. Um, my Lord, there is myself and two juniors. Yes, indeed. And I would point out my learned friend had a team of 10 at the return of their hearings at last count. It, it, it is not. Uh, disproportionate to have leading counsel and a junior as my learned friend has and two mm -hmm. solicitors um, or people from the law firm attending. And you charge by the hour? Yes. The five hours is except it would, would not be what you're going to charge. I, I beg your pardon, my lord. I... At the moment you've got attendance at hearing yourself and two others, five hours each. Indeed, my lord. I mean, the hearing has lasted three hours. We, we've been preparing for it this morning, and we'll probably have some work to do um, after, but uh, we didn't quite. And um, yes, well, I'll hear what Mr. Joseph has to say. Mr. Joseph, do you accept, first of all, the liability and cost, or do you argue against that? Um, no, <clears throat> uh, we accept that uh, the costs would uh, <clears throat> fall uh, against us, uh, but not on an indemnity basis. We say on a standard basis, uh, we don't accept that um, our challenge was spurious. Um, there are serious issues being raised about the enforcement processes in multiple jurisdictions. Um, and uh, we don't accept at all that it is a case for indemnity costs. Um, we don't think that this is a case for summary assessment today either. Um, it wouldn't uh, be the normal practice, but um, obviously there is a power to uh, for you to consider summary assessment. Um, but is it, is it not the normal practice? I, my impression was that in a short hearing of less than half a day, it well, maybe for, maybe for less than half a day. I, I, I yeah. said that, but 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 the point is that <clears throat> that uh, as I'm going to go through a few of these items, so there I is. Just, I must interrupt. Uh, the, the the rule is quite clear. It's thirty eight point three zero. The hearing is less than one day. Um, it is appropriate for uh, immediate assessment of costs. Right. Um, the, 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 um, the, there, there, is, there are certain uh, elements of the uh, statement which we just received yesterday um, that have um, a, an inherent lack of clarity. And uh, in one case, um, we say uh, looks a bit questionable, uh, which would uh, either lean to not making a summary assessment or uh, to uh, cutting down the cost figures. So. Um, if you go through the different items, 2200, um, it is entirely unclear <clears throat> what these attendances are on um, uh, at the bottom of the page. Um, it, it doesn't look as though it's attendance on opponents, which is at the top of the next page. 
and it doesn't look as if it's attendance on others uh, because uh, that is also listed separately. So that is. Um, uh, I assume there's attendance on clients. Yes, it is. It's a standard form or attendance on clients. The the third item of attendance on others is is again unclear. Um, that certainly, if it's not attendance on um, the uh, clients, um, attendance on others, there's very very little correspondence uh, or anything like that in this case, and so it's not clear what that is relating to. The entire uh, uh, um, hours spent on work on documents, I've totted it up, comes to 153 hours. And that does look um, uh, slightly high um, as far as we're concerned. And then the point that um, my Lord has already made about attendance of the hearings, the two hour hearing, um, I appreciate that we um, had a little bit of technical glitch and we've also um, waited an hour for the judgment, but we, there's no basis for saying that it's an attendance at a hearing of five hours. So um, uh, we would ask you to make adjustments in relation to that. My, my learned friend says, well, we had to incur the, incur the filing fee. Um, that may be so, but um, it, it, they would incur the filing fee um, in a case even where um, there was no recovery whatsoever um, from the defendants. And there may well be questions of uh, stay of execution uh, of the execution process which come hereafter, which may well render this whole exercise um, uh, somewhat um, um, futile um, because the position has been stated on affidavit that there are no assets for enforcement. And so it's not quite clear what this process has really been about. Um, so we would say no indemnity costs not summary assessment, but if it is, then you have to make an allowance for the kinds of items that we've been talking about and maybe uh, arrive at a total figure of 80% um, uh, or that order, 80, 75, 80% of, of, of the total figure. Yes, thank you. Do you want to say anything about those particular points that have been picked up? Uh, just on the execution, I mean, that would be separate proceedings with separate costs, so it's not relevant at all to your assessment. And if, my lord, you are minded to grant indemnity costs, um, any doubt should be resolved in our favour. Um, and there's not been any real substantive complaints to the to the figure. Well, what about the attendance on others? Who are the others? It's internal work, my lord. It's it's basically meetings, discussions, etc. Um, discussions I mean, with the court, discussions with uh, with among ourselves, um, uh, 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 reviewing work and so on and so forth. Yes, and doesn't that isn't that covered by work done on documents? Uh, they they're not the same thing, my lord. Right, and um, work done on documents comes to one hundred and fifty three hours. I think Mr. Joseph said. Seems quite a lot. Well, Lord, the bundle, as you will no doubt know, is several thousand pages in length. Um, I have certainly read every page of it, um, uh, and, and I've had to because of the various things that have been going on. Um, there's also the preparation for the hearing and, and so on and so forth. Um, well, Lord, this is a, a claim for 124 million dollars it's been made extremely complicated um and we've had to prepare for a jurisdictional challenge etc etc um so as i mean the figures are in no way unreasonable can i just ask you um have, have the other side put in a schedule of costs um well no they didn't and they didn't at the last hearing either um one can't compare what that team of 10 cost at the last hearing um sadly um, but uh, one suspects that it's it, it, that, well, the, the rules provide that you must provide a schedule one day in advance. Um, they haven't. Um, we can't compare it, but there's no reason to suspect that, that our bill is any higher than theirs. And I can't remember, the other expenses total is what? Uh, the other expenses are the claim form, which is 
they run applications fees uh, oh, for junior council and the transcript from the okay. previous year. That figure of 232 is simply the sum, sum of the ones above? Yes, yes. And um, the filing fee is, of course, something we had to incur to make the application. We won the application. There's absolutely no reason why that would not be a recoverable yeah. cost. So, any, any you want to add, Mr. Joseph? Um. No, I, I'm not quite sure where, where he gets his team of 10 from. If only if 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 uh, I, I could have done with a team of 10, but uh, I'm not sure I did have one. But um, anyway. Yes, thank you. Well, I think it is an appropriate case for indemnity costs. I, I think the the case was run on the basis of challenging jurisdiction as well, which dropped out very fair, sensibly at the beginning of the hearing. Um, the, the, there's been no in my, my view, no proper basis for opposing this application. And um, I think it's appropriate to order indemnity costs. It doesn't make much difference when one is doing a summary assessment of costs, but insofar as it switches the burden of proof onto the paying party to, to knock down any particular amounts, it seems to me that the likelihood is you arrive at the same figure. But uh, what I'm going to do is uh, re recognise the force in a little bit of the uh, attendance figures, but not not very much. Uh, what I'm propo proposed to do is to make an order in favour of the uh, claimants for 800,000. That's, that's knocking off 71,000 dirham, which is, I think, can, can, people can live with, given the enforcement problems anyway. So I'll make an order for costs on an indemnity basis in favour of the claimants for the sum of 800,000 dirham. Is there anything else that needs to be dealt with today? Yeah, well, thank you very much, both of you, for your helpful submissions. Thank you. That concludes the hearing. Saeed, if you can send, send something to me once it's been typed out, I'll have a look at it and correct it. Yes, of course. Thank you very much, all of you.